AI won't take your job, someone using AI will. You may have heard this phrase last year. If you want a head start into 2024, join the free masterclass on AI and training design, organized by a new spring in collaboration with leading AI and learning researcher Dr. Philippa Hartman. On Tuesday, February 13, we'll dive headfirst into leveraging AI for designing your training. Visit thenewspring.com or the link in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Hello there, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Learning Hack entitled, oh no, the auto is jammed. Oh f***, what do I do now? Just improvise. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now guess what? Learning is cool. 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 Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. I'm learning. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge. Uh, my guest this time on The Learning Hack is uh, all about improvisation. Her name's Belina. I can remember talking to her. I can't quite remember what we talked about. Oh, I'm really no good at this. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact. Tell us about her. Hack Facts. Melina Raffi is Master Collaborator and Empress, it says here, of Mafic Limited based in Berlin. Mafic is a consultancy and training company that helps people in organisations develop improvisation ability. She's lived in many different countries, including the UK, and worked in finance before finding her vocation as a learning person. Belina has studied at institutions including Ithaca College, New York, the Chinese University in Hong Kong and Cranfield School of Management. We admire great improvisers in art. Charlie Parker, (laughs) Jimi Hendrix (laughs) and so on. But when it comes to our leaders in business and government, we're often not so sure. We don't like to think they're making it up as they go along. We want to know they're acting according to a strategy they've got a plan. But life in the modern world is a chaotic, uncertain thing, full of unexpected shocks, and the best strategy can be pretty useless when faced with an out-of-the-blue, game-changing event. To repeat Mike Tyson's probably overused quote, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I wanted to know what Belina can do to help people who have to make that important decision in that moment after they've been punched in the mouth. When the stock market crashes, when the wind gets up and tears the roof off your house, when a pandemic or a war breaks out, how do you act in the moment? What is the secret to being a great improviser? Belina Raffi, it's great to have you on the podcast. Welcome to The Learning Hack. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to be here. So uh, you describe yourself on LinkedIn as a capacity builder, capacity builder for activators of awesomeness. Wonderful yes. stuff. Making saving the world more delightful, connected and powerful. I, but I think the core of what you do is working with business people uh, on kind of how they lead, manage and perform in the workplace and instilling the skills of improvisation coming from the kind of world of the performing arts, improv comedy. People may know about that as a thing. They might have attended some improv performances, which uh, can be really, really good. I've seen some very good ones. Um, I liked your caveat of can be too, because <laughs> there's this, the silly and sublime, isn't there? There's like, a, yeah, yeah, like any but, discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've had a background and improvising wasn't something I was great at. I like to have a script, you know, uh, similarly with these podcasts. So I feel slightly at a disadvantage, Belina, because you're kind of, you've got all your improv skills and I've decided not to work from a script and I feel a very a great disadvantage here. So here's, here's the good news is that one of the uh, practices of improv is you take great care of your partner. So if we both do that, I think we'll be fine. How about that? That sounds good. And yes, I I'm sure I'm going to learn. A lot through this um, through the, through this conversation, um, but I ought to ask a question to kick it off anyway. So, uh, what use is improvisation to serious business people? Mm-hmm. It's useful to every every human on the planet, and 
What's very interesting about that word serious is I think a lot of people conflate serious with solemn. And you can have, you can get really serious work done and have a great time doing it. So that's one of the things that I'm bringing in with the work that I do is that there's no need to be overly solemn <laughs> just because we're getting real work done, meaningful work done, serious work done. Um, the other thing is, is what's lovely about improv is, is we, we genuinely do, we improvise all the time. And when we make it conscious, we can also do things that practice, um, that, sorry, that we can practice at, and it becomes easier and we can have more fun doing it. We, we, we can become more skilled doing it. So that's what I, why I do what I do is because we can practice this stuff. Hmm. So um, anyone who's has had a performing background at all will know that there are some people who are very good at improvising. In fact, it's their complete modus operandi, as it were, and other people who are less good at it. Um, how do you find that working with groups? Do, do you do you have to kind of do a bit of um, work at the beginning of a of a session, for instance, to find out who the the natural improvisers are, and and then how do you respond to that difference in ability with improvisation? Yeah, beautiful. The, so I I work with applied improvisation. So um, this is improv mindset and practice, which is for non theatrical application. Right. Yeah. So um, and what's lovely about improv is that it really helps level the playing field. And so if you have a very senior manager and a middle manager and somebody um, who works with a middle manager, improv tends to be a really good leveler. And it's also structurally a very good leveler of we take short turn takings, we keep switching partners and we're really noticing what are the patterns that are happening on today <laughs> or how we're showing up in the workshop. Are we having difficulty with things like letting go of control or do we find it more easy? And so um, I really scale the experience of the workshop so that we start easy and we build um, skill set all together so that we we can get towards flow. So it's not about showcasing the ones that are good and like making the ones that have a more difficult time feel terrible about themselves. It's more about like, how do we all, how can we create conditions so that we all shine? And also how can we notice for ourselves if, if there was a particular activity that was difficult, get curious about it, suspend judgment. And, and also notice that, you know, like uh, today it might be hard, tomorrow it might be easier. So um, yeah, does it does that help? <laughs> Yeah, certainly. So what sits inside that skill of, of being able to improvise, do you think? What are, what are the kind yeah. of moving parts in a capability to improvise? Yeah, I love it. So there's a fabulous guy named Robert Poynton, and he wrote uh, several books. One of them is Everything is an, or Everything's an Offer. And he has a, um, a triangle model of the, called the core capabilities of improv. <laughs> So what are we doing when we improvise? And it's let go, notice more, use everything. So let go of ideas or behaviors that are not serving us in this moment. Um, notice more. So you got to notice that something's not serving you. <laughs> but you can also notice about like your resources, how you're feeling today, how your your colleagues um, seem like what are the resources surrounding you within you um, and we notice them more broadly than typically in in organizations and then use everything or use what's of service in where you're trying to get to so let go notice more use everything so without giving a, a, away too much of your kind of working methods can you give <laughs> us some examples of how this, this this might work in a workshop setting yes um so um there are lots of activities that we can do, and it's interesting, even the language can be shifted. So they're improv games or they're exercises or they're activities. It depends on how overly serious <laughs> the organization is, uh, but basically they're all the same exchange of interaction and it's practicing those things. So uh, an example might be um, a really easy game where we tell a story one word at a time and they, you know, your, your listeners might have heard that or watched that on, on whose line is it anyway, where, um, and the skills that we're using 
um, is really how do we let go of control so that if the other person gives an unexpected word, we can follow the nature of that new word that is like departure from where we think the story should go. So there's that practicing of letting go. There's also being like really present and curious to what is unfolding, which is really important in business because there's so many unexpected things happening in terms of the environment, in terms of resources, in terms of, you know, can your colleague come to work because, or do they have uh, COVID or something like that? So there's so many different changes that we need to um, be nimble at sort of leading and following and noticing. Um, I always do interactions uh, and games content neutral, meaning we are telling a one word story about like a gorilla that went to Paris, for example. Um, and because I want people to practice the mindset and behavior without getting drawn into a discussion about the content about work where they might have inherent right answers that might be different from their partners. So we're trying to kind of park all that stuff that would distract people from the actual um, focus on the practice of this new way of being. And then we say, okay, you know, like where could taking short turns actually benefit you at work? You know, like how could we have a meeting feel this joyful and this connected and this fluid, for example? So it is there the, the the danger there when you take it away from the working situation that it feels frivolous or you know not connected to the the, the working situation until you bring it back to there is it is it do people struggle with being taken out of out of their comfort zones in that way sorry to use that horrible cliche yeah no that's all right I mean usually that's why we're there because there's something in the everyday that's actually not quite working well. So it's like, okay, what happens if we try on different behaviors? And I've learned over years of working with like chief financial executives and and groups uh, with NASA and you know like a different different high profile um, clients, what is a well structured, gentle way in so that people will have a go? I, and I also think that that you know applied improvisation has been around since now the 90s. It's taught in a lot of the top MBA schools um, so mm -hmm. that like people are more familiar with it. And this goes so much more beyond like team building and team building is important in and of itself, but a lot of people kind of pigeonhole improv as, okay, it's going to be team building. We're going to do this and then we're going to go to the real work. And it's like, no, no, no. This is actually a really fabulous mindset and practice to navigate complexity for leaders, for um, all sorts of different applications. And maybe one more piece that I love about it is if we're in a workshop together and we're, we're uh, focusing on how do we collaborate more effectively, how do we engender trust, those practices in the work context also port out to different aspects of your life. So um, there's a certain game uh, that I do um, that is uh, acknowledging value in somebody else's idea and building on it. And I swear that that activity, even though we we use it as how do you become a great service designer or a, you know more creative at work, it's also saved marriages because you know like if you use those same <laughs> principles, like it really kind of helps helps in lots of different realms. Yes, yeah, improvisation very important in a marriage. I, yeah. <laughs> so to pick pick up on um, some of the themes that you've you've raised there, I mean a, a lot. I mean a lot of things occur to me there. One is that um, what would trigger for an organization? You say that you might be called in because something is not working particularly well. What's the sort of situation that might trigger a need, um, you know, for Belina Raffi to come in and give our people some improv? Yeah, a lovely question. Um, more and more, it's on complexity. Um, a lot of organizations have dealt with sort of how, how can we be more agile? How can we... Um, engage with the VUCA world, but they but they still found it difficult to sort of bridge that, okay, conceptually we know there's a VUCA world, but they sort of slip back to our regular kind of patterns of um, let's do a three-year plan. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's that's uh, uh, obsolete the moment almost or the, the week after we write it or uh, print it. Um, so this is really how do we balance some of those linear structures of of planning and and you know bringing in judgment and all of those useful things for certain things how do we complement that with our ability to improvise so that when we're faced with a situation which really needs to uh, for us to improvise fluidly we're not 
relying, going back or falling back on the linear <laughs> practices just because they're stronger. Hmm. So it's kind of, it's, it's to give companies more choice around, around how they respond. Raising yet more uh, potential <laughs> questions here, but I'm, I'm going to backtrack slightly. Um, okay. I, th I think we, we tend to think of, of almost everything in training immediately as an, about the individual before mm -hmm. we kind of think of the, the collective or the organization or the, or the culture. Uh, and one thing you said there was earlier on was, I think you said, um, depending on how serious or non-serious the company is, and, and that, that plays to company culture. Sure. Uh, you, I, I've been in and out of a lot of companies because I, I work freelance as well as having had salaried positions. And the culture of companies is markedly different. And I'm sure you find that going into to companies. You know, some are very kind of structured. Um, others are more kind of, you know, especially startups, very non-structured. How do you find those differences and how much do you think that alters the attitude towards the ability to improvise and, and, and you know, an understanding of it as an important part in a person's toolkit? Mm. I think there's a big, so to do improv well, you need, um, you need a lot of trust. And so companies that have a big blame culture or sort of toxic banter or, you know, things like that, um, sometimes improv can be used to kind of go back to basics and start to engender some trust. But if there's really low trust in an organization, I think that's that's the hardest um, gig to get. Um, so it's not so much about sort of, you know, I've, 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 I've worked with some very serious people and, and there's an innateness of, if, if you can reflect on an experience that's just happened, and then have a conversation about like, oh, how, how might we project this into the future? How might this be useful? If, if a group is up for that, regardless of their culture, then it, it tends to land. If there's trust, then as I said, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the, one of the few places that's really tricky is if there's a low cu trust culture. And sometimes improv can be brought in to help. But if that is immediately crushed by, by middle managers or senior managers because of their behavior, then it, it just won't work. Okay. So do you ever find yourself in the position where so, uh, saying to a client, look, you brought me in to work on this particular issue, but actually it's not me you need. You you need to change your culture <laughs> to be more of a, to, to be a more trusting culture. Has it ever happened that you've had to say, this is just isn't going to work because you're all a load of untrusting <laughs> ourselves or whatever. Obviously you wouldn't have used that kind of right. you know, well, podcast to type language. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I've been in the game long enough that luckily people kind of seek me out for the culture right. piece that I'm bringing. Um, uh, and specifically to how do we strengthen a culture that is high trust, improvisational, support each other. Um, I'm just trying to think. I was in one gig really early on where um, like the board of trustees brought me in. And there was one guy who was normally like the organizer of these events. And two other of two other people on the board brought me in instead of him and the group it was a like engineering and construction group the group was warmly responding to me in a way that threatened him personally like he, yeah. he and he became it was like i think it was it, i've only had this twice but I, it was a, he became effectively a workshop terrorist because it was one of those disgruntled people who didn't want to leave he wanted to stay but he wanted to d stay and disrupt um so yeah. so it was a great test of my improv skills <laughs> and um yeah and then funnily enough i didn't go back uh, to that place uh you, you mentioned vuca and uh, when yeah. when we had a kind of pre-meet when I when I last talked to you before this conversation, uh, I think I mentioned to you that you know um, when the pandemic hit, I, I suddenly found that terminology kind of risible. So I thought <laughs> you know for, for years it seemed we'd been talking about the volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous yeah. Yeah. global context, and then suddenly you had a pandemic. Then you had a you know a, a, a war. Um, uh, and and all the other things that have that have happened, and you you found yourself saying, well, you know, did we really think the world was so VUCA then? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at this now, you know. Yeah. So I mean, obviously there there's a question in here somewhere, Belina. Honestly, 
Obviously, I, you know, it, it's it how volatile and uncertain the, the 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 context you're operating in varies at different times, doesn't it? I, mean, I think our does... perception of it varies, it, it, you know, because I also work a lot in okay. sustainability and climate yeah. projects and things like that. So I, I think our perception, what we're allowed to kind of explore and discuss varies at different organizations versus. Um, and, and it is sort of what what do you take in that is useful versus debilitating, I think, as well, um, you know, um, I don't know if this is a fruitful, but we talk about the VUCA world, you know, like, and, and things about Ukraine is, is still going on. Um, uh, so that could, it, the whole war on Ukraine had a huge impact on fertilizer prices, for example, in Central America, because, and I'm connected with the Central American um, sustainability project. So there's a lot of knock-on effects that are because of a VUCA world that are, mm. we couldn't predict ahead of time. And this is, and and I think our challenge as a whole global human group is how do we make more beautiful choices with the uh, with the present moment and the resources that we have. The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. So while we're on the subject of kind of leadership within crisis, um, which of course has been you know, a, a, a very topical thing recently. It, are there dangers to encouraging leaders to improvise? In, in other words, to wing it? I mean, because we've seen some terrible examples of that in the pandemic. Uh, people yeah. who have naturally great, um, you know, I'm not going to kind of personalise this, but we've seen people who have naturally great improvisatory skills as leaders yeah. um, getting into terrible trouble by just kind of winging it when, where, yeah. where they should be. And especially in the dialogue between scientists and government leaders, you see a lot yeah. of that going on. I think, I don't think improv is the problem. I think integrity is the problem there. And I, I think when people improvise with integrity, even if they make a wrong choice, if they own it and then try to, to um, shift based on what's emerging because they've made a wrong choice, I, I, I think that's always preferable than trying to hide stuff or trying to, so I, for me, the the cringy responses in terms of of the pandemic and so, some of those things, it was actually more an integrity thing than a, a skillful improv improv thing. Yes, um, that's a really interesting distinction, and, and it it's making me think that in in my own attitude to this, I've probably got an unhelpful binary going between people who are kind of improvisational, maybe not so strong on the integrity, and the people who want to take scientific approach, um, you know, tick every box and all the rest of it, uh, and, and are therefore a bit rigid. But perhaps that's that's a wrong binary, do you think? I hope so. I think so. I think there's some beautiful people who improvise as their way of being in the world and who are genuinely trying to do good and are trying to be aligned with their values. Um, yeah, I... I, I I think that's a different vibe. Like in, in, having integrity, not having integrity. I think it's a different line to being able to improvise and not being able to improvise. Yeah. So improvising with integrity, and I think when I, I, I was trying to think of a, a, a leader who could do both of those, and I thought of um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt mm -hmm. um, and his response to the Depression, which was, you know, partly partly based on. Um, on advisors, but also a lot of improvisation in there. I know some people will violently disagree with that and hate Roosevelt, but there you go. <laughs> Didn't he used to like point out a building like across a field and, and insist on going on straight lines, I think, to test like could he actually get through all of the obstacles in between him and the, the thing that he pointed to in the distance that he wanted to tackle? I think that was, depending on the Roosevelt, I think that was a Teddy Roosevelt sort of um, thing. Um, oh, a different Roosevelt. A different Roosevelt, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. sorry, yes. <laughs> His predecessor, One of them yes. Roosevelt. <laughs> One of them, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, the, um, I, I also think that it's, the integrity piece, so improv is a technology that is designed to help people who are 
afraid on stage to be present, connected, and generous. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's a difference between somebody being fear-driven and spontaneous <laughs> with somebody who's improvising in a grounded way. And I, I'd like to maybe tease those apart. I think that's maybe what you're, um, a lot of people think of improv as you like, you had a beautiful plan and then something went wrong and you had to improvise. And they're like, oh, and, yeah. and actually there's a, it, it can help you respond instead of react. Like it can yeah. help you respond to things in, in a more measured way, in a way that takes on board more of the emergent qualities of what's happening. But yeah. you, can, you can also co-create something that's needed. You know, friend comes around, uh, uh, Paul Jackson, who um, uh, co-founded the Applied Improvisation Network, often says, you know, somebody comes around your house for dinner and you have to improvise with the ingredients that you have to make a meal. Mm. So it's, it's um, there can be a, a lovely, like, co-creating with what is. Um, and there can be a response as well versus a reaction. Um, yeah. And making me think of that perhaps overused quote. Uh, I can't remember if it's um, Muhammad Ali or Joe Frazier who said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so improvisation in that context would be, uh, okay, I've been punched in the face. Plan A didn't work out. What's plan B? How do I yeah. kind of work with the way this person's punching me? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Rather than just, oh my God, you know, I'm go back to being a 10 year old, being having your first yeah. training in the boxing ring and falling yeah. back on something that you know very comfortably as a pattern. Yeah. And actually, if we go back to the one word story, I often run it. Um, so if you're listening to this podcast and you bring me an act surprise if I do this in your company, but um, if we do one word story, I often run it kind of cold of just showing the mechanics of it. How does it go? And then sending people off and then bringing them back and asking them how, what the content was. Cause it's usually, you know, like the, um, uh, the gorilla went to jail and became a heroin addict and <laughs> lost, you know, like lost his wife or whatever. It, we tend to go negative when we're nervous yeah. and with improv, we then bring in simple rules to help us go like neutral to positive, or at least overcome that negativity bias. Um, we 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 go positive. We keep it simple, and um, keep it, and be specific also because that all of those three things help our partner co-create with us. If mm -hmm. we're too general, you know, like, um, uh, John, I had a cake, you know, great. I had a chocolate cake with pink sprinkles on it. Like you can picture, you know, that specificity and that helps us to co-create together. Um, so there's, yeah, those are some things that help. Slightly change the subject a bit. I'd, I'd like to come back to kind of theoretical underpin Mm -hmm. to, to your practice because as we're talking as I do this other podcast Great Minds on Learning and I've got um, very kind of short form knowledge I have to say <laughs> of, of, a, of a lot of learning theorists and what they said all the time this is kind of sparking off things so for instance when we're talking about different com company cultures um, different personality profiles that's making me think of that whole area in, in the training world of personality profiling you mm -hmm. know some of it very bad, you know, Myers-Briggs and so on, but other of that stuff, quite interesting, you know, based on Jung or or, or whoever. Um, is that, does that come into your, the, the, the way that you kind of sum up and work with a group, for instance? Um, sort of. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did an MBA at Cranfield and I kind of went through the battery of all of those tests. Um mm. Uh, I came out as an ENFP and people say that they could tell I'm an ENFP from space. Um, and I have to say that I actually feel like I'm an extroverted introvert because the, what I do is I have to talk to think. <laughs> so like, like that helps me or write to think, but I also really value alone time and I get a lot of energy from it. So um, I think it's useful to know the Myers-Briggs stuff just in terms of um, understanding that I can't just design for myself. So I actually try to change the learning style at least every 20 minutes in a workshop to make sure that if something wasn't quite right for somebody's preferences, the next one might be. Um, uh, so that's how it informs what I do and how I design. 
Yeah. I suppose I should say declare a preference here. I, I'm, I, I completely hate all, all forms of personality profiling because I think they put people in boxes. And oh, sure. Yeah. Learning styles a bit of a no-no as well, I suppose. Although people do have, you know, it, it, it's well known people have different preferences about the way they learn and, and some people are turned on by books and other people's aren't and, and so on. Um, that it's very interesting that 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 comes into that. Another thing that that leapt into my brain was um, just because I've been editing a podcast today about generative AI. Is mm. Wittgenstein came into this and the thing of, of language games that um, uh, and Vygotsky said that it's not that language comes out of the ability to use language comes out of intelligence, but that in, uh, language. Intelligence is a product of language, which is an interesting one to get your head around. And Wittgenstein, in the in the same kind of bracket, believed that we that all language was about playing various types of language games. And there is a thing in improv, collective improv, that you kind of agree between you what game we're playing, and you can see people switch yeah. the game halfway through an improv, which is really interesting. You know, it, ah. I, I, I've seen improv sessions where. A group of people, of very practiced improvisers, will improvise together, and then uh, they'll be telling a story in one genre. It's like kind of murder mystery or whatever, yeah. and then someone in the audience has to shout out a different genre. Yes, yeah. and then they have to to switch to that. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So I think all that is really fascinating about you know, and and of course, with your Wittgenstein, I look at that and say, yeah, this is language games. This is something we, as as humans, we're really great at. Um, I used to play a bit with that with metaphor and organization. So I was really yeah. inspired by um, images of organization by, it just popped out of my head, Mor uh, Gareth Morgan. Um, and um, it, how how much the language shaped thought. So if you're using things like scorecards and, you know, team meetings and things like that, that is, uh, business as a sport tends to be quite active. And, and he wrote an interesting observation that, if you use a lot of sports metaphors, that can be great. And that can also be dangerous because if it leaks into a sport where like, if the ref doesn't catch you, go for it. If you're, if you're yeah. amped up that on com um, competition that much. So, th so it, it was interesting that it can not only shift your thinking, your language can shift your thinking, but it can also shift the morality a little bit, depending on, on how it's held by the, by the leaders. Um, yeah, and and I I've always been interested in business as a living organism mm. because we are living organisms. So so what could we see? And the fact that we could see such different things about our organization depending on the metaphor that we try on is really interesting. You know, like uh, um, marketing campaigns. Campaigns come from war language. Um, you know, what happens if you want to woo your customers in, instead of love language? And there's all sorts of things that you can do to just expand. How do we see what's really, or more slices, more expansively, what's really here and what's possible? Hmm. Um, what What do you find most inspirational in the kind of theoretical background or neuroscience, neurobiology? You know, pick your discipline. There's a lot of them involved in. <laughs> it's a spin the wheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do a lot of it. I come to a lot of it intuitively and then I'll read something from like neuroscience and, and it, they'll have a theory of like that reinforces, oh, that's the way I've been doing oh, it. I always you know, talk like, I love anyway. that. Yeah, just, <laughs> and honestly, like it's, and it's really comforting that, uh, but um, so I tend to, I tend to lead by intuition and, and what works, right? Clearly like what, what works, uh, but it seems to be backed up. Um what do I find is it? I do find the metaphor work interesting. I find biomimicry work very inspiring. Of Sorry, what's that? Biomimicry. Biomimicry. Yeah. So one of the about that. the types about of projects that I've been doing is uh, for many years actually is looking at how let's look at how nature thrives and can we learn from those dynamics as applied to our own organization. So back in I don't know, uh, probably 2010, I worked with a group called Biomimicry for Creative Innovation. And my job was to bring improv in to help bring to life some of those dynamics in nature. And then we could have mm -hmm. that experience and talk about how that applies uh, to our organization. And what I love about that, met playing with that metaphor, business as a living organism, is it's 
it suddenly becomes inherently sustainable instead of having like a sustainability department over there that's counterbalancing all the you know like all the stuff that the rest of the organization is doing. It's if you pull in, you know, there's a beautiful question by Michelle Holiday of um, what might be different if we really wanted life on the planet to thrive in our organization. And if you pull that through to different places in the organization, there's some really interesting work that can be done there. Uh, could you give any examples of how that's worked out on particular projects? Yes. Um, so one of the things I, I, that I remember, we we got a group at, to Q, and um, we had a biologist ex, um, describing how um, mushrooms uh, use the air for lift for their spores so that they could spread their um, spores. And, and we were we had a, an interesting conversation about what might marketing look like <laughs> if if like, you know, like the, the spread of the information um, happened that way. So that's that's like from a really long time ago. Um, we uh, when I worked with Michelle Holiday, we were looking at sort of three meta patterns, which is what is it, within the organization? How do you how do you engender belonging? Um, how do you show yourself to the outside world in a way that's really nurturing? And how do you connect kind of this boundary from the outside world to the inside world and, and keep these dynamic flows? So um, things like she has a beautiful model and one of the things is about um if we look at what and um, what is like the the purpose of the organization um and the, the name of it's just popping out of my head but the, like what's driving the whole organization to be together to really manifest this thing on the um and then does that map onto what your employees find incredibly meaningful so how do, and how do you kind of cultivate that so that all of your employees are like really excited to be there. And and I guess an example of that is, you know, the, the famous thing of the janitor. Somebody asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm helping put a man on the moon. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? By cleaning yeah, it. Yeah. It's like, how does everybody have that real sense of pride and and uh, purpose when they're when they're in an organization? And part of that is just making clear, um, you know, what does this company really stand for? And and in a live sense, not just in a spouse sense. Yeah, I think one of my favorite um, favorite metaphors from the from the world of nature, I suppose the more biological, is it, it, it's this factoid I heard about squirrels that you know mm. they bury their nuts and yeah. hide them away and squirrel them away. Literally, uh, apparently they lose eighty percent of them. I can't <laughs> find eighty percent of the nuts that, that right. they bury. And then, it, you know, initially they well, you know, aren't squirrels crap? That's really stupid. But you think, what is the squirrel doing? squirrel is planting trees yeah exactly they're really important in that they, they are fulfilling a function through that um, forgetfulness for the for the rest of the ecosystem and i you know being getting getting on in years and getting a bit forgetful myself um i try to think that my forgetfulness must have some kind of <laughs> benefit to society <laughs> benefit i don't know about you know better be inadvertent so yeah but what what how do you influence your environment without necessarily knowing about it and and I love it from there's an abundance element to what you just said. You yeah. know, like that the and and one of the awful culture things that I was involved with early on when I worked for Citibank in the back office was um implementing Six Sigma. It was just terrible because it was effectively um putting business as a machine on an altar and mm. and ignoring all of the things that didn't um, that weren't mapped, but were still really important. Yeah. Um, so there, it, I found that really, really stressful, um, both to implement or, or try to implement. Um, uh, because it was I, so non-organic and so... Yes, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And, and pe there is that mantra, what we can't measure, we can't manage, which always makes me think, I think I've said this before on the podcast, because it always makes me think, well, what are you going to do about the stuff that you can't measure? Yeah. And there, there's uh, I've just started collaborations with two really interesting rock stars in the United States. I'm based in Berlin, Germany, and and these two ladies are in Minneapolis. And one of them is a rock star in complexity and really like wise action in complexity. And another one is on monitoring and evaluating of complex uh, projects like human rights projects and things like that. Yeah. Um, and she's looking at how do we notice patterns through storytelling. Um, and 
uh, or both of the ladies are, are looking at storytelling as being incredibly important and noticing patterns from that. And they're saying in complex systems, if you zero down in the, in the quest for accuracy into the minutia of, you know, like uh, exactly how many nuts, nuts did that squirrel do? And um, you're zooming in too close and you actually get a less accurate picture than if you zoom out a little bit and notice broader patterns of mm -hmm. what the system is doing. So I find that sort of thing interesting too, that the way that we tend to think of like let Descartes, let's chop everything up and see the individual parts. That's not a helpful approach yeah. to what we're all facing now. Your bio is fascinating. I think you've lived in a lot of different places uh, and you've, you've done a lot of, of, of things. Could you give us a, a, a kind of um, uh, thumbnail biography of yourself, if you like? Not too thumbnail. <laughs> you, you've got five, ten minutes. <laughs> right, right. It might take that because yeah. it's complicated. How, how you, though, yeah. Yeah. What, what were your roots and how did you yeah. get interested in learning and how did you come to be doing this? And... Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have a go. I'll have a go. <laughs> so um, I'm half French and half American, uh, US American. Mm -hmm. And my, just to go back to see kind of where I'm coming from, my, my um, mom, when she was 15, moved to Paris from Maryland uh, to study with Marcel Marceau. She was the first American apprentice oh, to Marcel wow. Marceau. And um, my dad was one of the premier ballet dancers in the Paris Opera Ballet. Um, and so that's, so I have two passports. And uh, as you can tell, my my accent, they divorced when I was young. <laughs> I grew up in North America. And um, I actually grew up in the US, Mexico and Canada, sort of moving around. And then we came back to Maryland um, when I was in middle school. So I think all of that moving around just primed me for improv frankly, because, you know, languages were changing, countries were changing and everything as a kid. And it just, how can I be present and notice what's happening and connect in useful ways? Um, yeah. uh, I lived in England for 15 years um, uh, and uh, loved it. And so I feel culturally patterned. I, I spell things with use, <laughs> like color and labor and things like that. Um, I feel culturally patterned most on the UK. Um and I did a semester abroad in Hong Kong and and um, I've lived in Germany now for eight years and I love Berlin. I got to say it's it's a magical Me too. Uh, yeah. place. So a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but how did I, I think the big why do I do what I do is is probably my experience in, in working in um, uh, in the back office of the bank and seeing that disconnect between let's pretend everything is linear and predictable and having the complexity of humans, but also complex IT systems and things and seeing the two not mesh. So I did an MBA at Cranfield to relax because <laughs> we had done them. The same group had done the back office sort of changes for the Euro and then Y2K compliance. And that really burnt out a bunch of people. Mm. Um, and then I ended up getting my first job out was um, like marketing excellence and and how do we how do we um, use games? So part of it was was resonant with me. How do we use games to come up with blockbuster um, uh, drugs for for pharmaceuticals and things like that? But two strange things were happening for me. One is they weren't debriefing any of the group dynamics, and the rest of the program was death by PowerPoint. So it felt mm -hmm. sort of straight. And and then I, when I was working for Citibank in New York, um, I actually took my first improv class and my first stand-up comedy class and kept taking them just as a way to stay sane. And that was in 1996. So like yeah. after the MBA, I'm like, maybe there's something in this improv stuff. So I studied with some of the best improvisers on the planet, Keith Johnston. And the, I studied at the, the theater he set up in Calgary. Um, I also uh, joined the Applied Improvisation Network and I was on the board of directors for six years and I made the co-founder be my business partner for several years to like learn as much. Uh, so that was kind of my trajectory. And and more and more, I'm really passionate about how do we help, um, you know, uh, businesses everywhere to really address kind of the, some of the bigger sustainability and societal stuff that's happening as well. Um, so how do we navigate that complexity? How do we have those conversations in a way that feels light and goes deep and allows for useful action? To, mm. Is that a potted? <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that was yeah. That? yeah, it's really good. Uh, um, an appropriate time as well. Brilliant. Mm. 
So coming more up to the uh, uh, up to the present, who do you look up to in this world of learning and people obviously you know relevant to the areas you work in? Where do you what are your water holes? Where do you learn mm -hmm. from people, associations, or communities? A lovely question. I mean, um, I'm mildly dyslexic, <laughs> and so I'm a very slow reader. Um, uh, I there's a book I'm reading at the moment when this just totally popped out of my head not, not helpful but like everything uh, it, it tracks the the history of mankind in a very interesting way and is looking not humankind which I love sorry I love Rug, Rugger Bregman's uh, work on that um uh, uh I, I can't I can't remember I can run over there and get my book <laughs> um but this is looking at at humans and what's the assumption of our innate goodness versus you know like warlike yeah. um i was going to uh, say sapiens but obviously it's not that no it's not sapiens yeah. it's a new i think it's a newer one um uh but basically if it's interesting how colored like if our beliefs are um if left to our own devices we're just going to devolve into war and attack each other um that generates a whole bunch of thought but if we uh, assume that actually if left to our own devices we tend to be kind we tend to be generous even though if we have a few blind spots that is a whole different group and i think i'm i've of the latter group um and so i'm really enjoying reading this book to see kind of what are the historical um uh, antecedents for for this way of being um the the two ladies actually that I'm really excited about, um, Glenda Yo Yang, as I mentioned, she's she's one of the rock stars in complexity, oh, and yeah. I'm getting really interested in. She has a, a company called Human Systems Dynamics Institute, and um, we've been in conversations for several weeks now of how do we bring together some of the improv stuff as at the gym for navigating complexity mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's really exciting. And I've already tried it with one organization, and the leaders were very. Um, please, because they're they've had a strategic initiative. Like you must be able to navigate complexity, but they don't yeah. understand the, like the practical, you know, bridge between theoretical and actually doing on the ground. Yes. Um, so that's that's, get, that's getting exciting for me. So that's a really important work for me because, you know, we 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 have a lot of um, abstract nouns, but we we're, we're, we're supposed to negotiate, you know, complexity, curiosity. Yeah, it had to be more curious. And they're, they're all nouns. Of course, Wittgenstein says that these are empty coins <laughs> and they don't mean anything. We, you know, we're, we're kind of um, a revolutionary past will, makes us want to kind of deal with things on a more concrete level. So it, it seems to me that you do make those connections uh, mm. in, in, in the type of work you do. It's really interesting. I'm really interested in that book you were talking about, uh, about whether you people... Hang you hang on one second. Can I can it later. Okay? Send, send it to me later. I'll put it in show notes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's really interesting because, you know, it's so, so much of the roots of our innate political beliefs we grow up are to do with, you know, are you a Hobbesian believer yeah. in the state of nature? Or being Rousseau, or... British of short, or are you a Rousseauist? And, yeah. and you know, and it, it's, it, it's odd the way those things, you see those things playing out again and again, you know. And they're actually. I'm just in the beginning of this book, um, but they're actually talking about what led to this this 16 um, in the 1600s. The thing that Rousseau wrote was for a competition um, oh. about essays on equality and inequality. And, That's and, right. Yes. And they're they're saying like what led to that? You know, like that the fact that in 16, 1600s they would be asking that question and linking it to. Um, basically colonization and connections with um, the First Nations in in, um, in, in America, the, the real Americans, <laughs> and and have in those conversations that happen between. And and yeah, I, I'm finding it a really exciting book. Uh, well, send us the title and I, we'll put that in the show notes. I will. And I'm sorry, I think this is a post-pandemic, like, I don't know if you have this, but there's definitely uh, my ability to retain certain types of information is less since after two years of like the stress of the pandemic. Um, yes. Well, I, I, yes, I suffer from that, you know, because obviously I'm older than you, so so it's even, it's worse. Um, uh, but I find it's good because it leads me to improvise. Yes, good. <laughs> Be really <laughs> present, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and that's me trying to kind of um, wrap things up neatly because um, we have to keep these things 
you know, to a reasonable length, although I'd love to talk to you more. Otherwise, the, okay. the, the files are big and it takes ages to upload to YouTube. <laughs> Which we don't want, yeah. <laughs> no, better, no better reason for it than that, folks. But this, this is the nature of digital media and, and what it does to formats. Um, but it's been great to talk to you, Belina. Um, you too, John. Thank you so much. It, it, it's been a bit more of a conversation. I know I've been firing questions at you, but it does feel like more of a conversation than a, a lot of the things. And I'm sure that's because you bring a, a very light touch to it. Um, uh and thanks a lot for that. So, thank cheers. you, John. Cheers. <laughs> That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors. The Learning Hack is among the top 5% most listened to podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes, we found out. But it depends for its existence solely on sponsorship and your Patreon contributions. If you want us to continue holding these excellent conversations about learning, it's you who said they're excellent, not us. Let's have a chat about your company sponsoring or sign up to patreon.com slash learning hack and for a piddlingly small amount of money, get transcripts, text summaries and early access. Keep us alive. Until next time. Stay curious, learning people. Now I finally get it.